Barry Peterson's story is told in a new book called The Tiger Man of Vietnam. And author and journalist Frank Walker joins us now in our breakfast studios. Frank, thanks very much for coming in. Good morning, Fran. Uh, Frank, this is an incredible tale and I think a little known part of Australian history. Tell us a bit about Barry Peterson, why the CIA chose him to head into the hills, literally, and work with the tribesmen up there. What was it about Barry Peterson? Barry Peterson was a captain at the time. He was 28 years old in 1963. Uh, At that point, we'd already had uh, members of the Australian Army training team uh, about a dozen men in the uh, in Vietnam uh, training the South Vietnamese forces. Um, Barry was a bit unusual. He, he'd spent, spent time in Malaya as part of the Malayan emergency where he had, as a young lieutenant, uh, worked with the, uh, the native peoples there trying to stop the Chinese communists coming into uh, Malaya. And he, he had, had a great affinity with these people. These were... The, they were fairly uh, simple uh, people. They fought with bows and arrows until the uh, Australians gave them guns. And uh, he was noticed then that he had, a, had this sort of talent to get on well with them. And he uh, was, when he went to uh, South Vietnam, he was picked out by uh, uh, Colonel Ted Sarong, who was the commander of the, uh, the army trainers. Uh, and, and he was uh, told, you will be going to join the CIA. Uh, you will fight under the CIA command and you will uh, go, uh, they do what they tell you. And Peterson thought, wacko, this is fantastic. You know, what a tremendously exciting assignment for a young bloke. And um, he was uh, sent over to the CIA. They operated under another name, uh, had a front, uh, a front name called the Combined Services Division. But um, they told him, uh, Barry, we want you to go up into the mountains near a town called Ban Mitut which was up in the central highlands, and we want you to form a, a guerrilla force uh, of, from the Montagnard people. Now, the Montagnards uh, live in the highlands of Vietnam. We're all the way up into what is now North Vietnam, and there are about uh, 13 or 14 different tribes. But again, they are a different ethnic group from the Vietnamese, and um, they hate the Vietnamese. And they were quite willing to to fight the Vietnamese, be they communist or South Vietnamese or whatever. And uh, so Barry went up into the mountains um, with uh, CIA uh, uh, supplies and money and he... formed this force and gradually built it up into about uh, more than a 1,000 men. Which is an incredible feat for one man, really, to lead that project. But let's just step back a little bit because, as you say, his commanders noticed this guy's good at sort of getting on with the locals, if you like, and there's some great examples of that in your book. Uh, Almost from the very start, from the moment he lands in Vietnam, he's kind of got this on show. Tell us about the the story of the, the cyclo. Right. Ah, well, he he had spent time in in uh, Malaya, as I said, and he'd quickly realised that in, in, it's good to have a couple of locals on your side, and uh, the, you know everybody uh, talks about you, everybody spies on you, and he thought, well, good to get someone on your side. So one of his ideas was that they they're, they're taxi drivers. Well, they ride these little cyclos that where they they uh, just pedal around, and you sit in the back like a, a sort of a cycle uh, rickshaw. And he realised that uh, it was um, these people were <laughs> really good for spies. And uh, so what he did was he asked the local, uh, well, he made friends with one of them and, and said, you know, how do you run your bicycle? Do you pay a rent for it? And he said, no, I, I, I pay a rent for it. And uh, I hope in, in about five years' time I'll have enough money to buy one. And Barry said, well, what's it cost? And he said, oh, about about 100 US dollars was the equivalent. So Barry said, right, here's 100 US dollars. Go and buy yourself a cyclo, but be on, you know, be there for me when I need you. So from that point on, he had us a friend and uh, the cyclo driver would tell him not only uh, uh, what the questions about him were from the local in t- local spies, but he would also lie to the local spies and said, no, I took him from here to there rather than the other place. And uh, so from that point on, Barry did this throughout his time in, in Southeast Asia. It was a very smart way 
way to plug into the local community. And I notice in your book you say they sent him off with a wad of cash, so this was part of his mission. Um, up in the hill tribes with the Montagna people, perhaps money wasn't necessarily the key ingredient. What was it? How did he form this lethal force from you know a bunch of people living in the hills? How did he go about that? There was a there was already a start there. The Americans had been there for some in them throughout the highlands for some time, training Montagnard, training South Vietnamese troops to try and resist the downward uh, march from the uh, north. Um, Ban Mi Tut was sort of in the path of the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. And uh, so Barry started off with a, a small corps of about 100 men who were under the command of the local South Vietnamese commander. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, he had to sort of play his cards very carefully to, to persuade the South Vietnamese commander to let him run the show. And uh, Barry quickly realised the best way to fight the Viet Cong was to use the same tactics as the Viet Cong. You form small units of no more than eight men and you would be out patrolling in the jungle the whole time. Patrol, you'd make friends with the local village, you'd use in the patrols, he always had people from the local village of the eight men, two would be from each village and he would try and make sure that they didn't stay more than one night in each village and move around so these men knew their territory intimately. Mm, this was a guerrilla <coughs> war. This was a guerrilla war. And you uh, you make the point in, in the book that, um, that Barry realised that these people were lethal fighters and they had real grudges against a lot of these people. So they wanted to not just necessarily, you know, knock off the leadership as you might do in guerrilla warfare. They actually wanted to uh, wreak vengeance on some of these people. And so they were a bit out of control at first. And Barry had this struggle with, you know, trying controlling their instincts yeah. and, and instilling in them the sense of values that a normal soldier might have learnt. That's right. That was a very strict code of conduct that Barry brought with him. Um, Barry's a very straight arrow. He's, he's, a, he's a straight shooter sort of bloke and he wasn't going to cop um, interference from the CIA. The CIA fairly left him alone at the beginning. As long as he was successful, he slowly built up that force from 100 and then the CIA said, well, double it, then triple it. And, and eventually he had 1,200 uh, guerrilla force. He established a second base under a warrant officer who was helping him. And um, it was uh, quite a, an achievement. Um, he got such an achievement that the Americans started taking big notice of him. The American ambassador came to visit him. This was General Maxwell Taylor, a former commander himself. And he came out and uh, said, why can't an American do this? And, of course, that really put the backs up of the CIA. They started to realise that uh, uh, with Peterson, they had something which they weren't quite sure they could control, Mm. that he was a bloke who wasn't under their total control, And uh, when Barry was asked, uh, after about two years in the job, he was asked to turn his men into teams of assassins. And this was the sort of start of what became the Phoenix Program. Uh, The Phoenix Program was a program of uh, targeting uh, assassins by using assassin methods, some of them very, very brutal and, and, and ugly, to um, uh, go into the, try and attack the hierarchy of the Viet Cong. And uh, the, the Viet Cong uh, were uh, quite terrified of this because they, they were, it, but it was out of control. It quickly got out of control. Who was in charge of this? And, and uh, the people they used were often former criminals. They were the worst mm. dregs of the world. So Barry said, I won't be part of this. And he just said no to the CIA. And that turned out to be a big mistake. And there's a lot more to this story, as you just implied, and we won't perhaps give away the punchline because people should read it. It is a fantastic read. But importantly, that whole notion of the uh, Operation Phoenix, you think that there was a message here in in that war Mm. um, that applies now in Iraq and Afghanistan? There is, because the Phoenix program, which in Vietnam um, became one of the darkest episodes of the Vietnam War and... um, uh, officially, it was responsible for about 20,000 uh, Vietnamese people being killed. It was had torture. It had oh, the worst elements of what happened in Vietnam. It got out of control. Um, professional soldiers like Barry started it. Um, the Australians were responsible in the initial, very initial phase for getting this thing underway. Um, but the Americans took it over and uh, uh, it got out of control. And um, there were... Fish, unofficial estimates put it at about 60,000 enemy killed, not nowhere nearly uh, any of most of them 
uh, Vietnamese communists at all. They were used by rivals to bump off um, people they wanted for their land or, you know, all sorts of things. Now, in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, the same program is, was brought up initially in Iraq, but now much more so in Afghanistan. And uh, our special forces troops are uh, starting to engage in this, and the danger is there it will also get out of control. 